a uh, good afternoon all um, um welcome to this webinar um the webinar of win the new normal with secure cloud thanks for joining us uh, this webinar has been organized by city telecom cpc and vm together um if during the presentation you have any question please type them in the q a uh, panel uh, we will try to answer all the questions in the event itself um but if time runs out or you do not have time we will make sure that all the questions will be responded via email uh, after this session uh, at the end of the event there is a short survey uh, that we hope that you can uh, fill in to help us and improving webinars in the future and for the amazon gift cards we will inform the lucky winner via email after the event for everybody that was not aware of that that's a good way to start this webinar so Let's start today uh, presentation by first looking at the agenda and I will share my screen as we speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's maximize this and bring this down. Okay, so um, today we're going to talk about when the new normal with secure cloud and what are we going to talk about today? So on the next slide, uh, you will see the agenda. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Citic Telecom CPC. Um, then I will dive into the customer challenges that we have for 2021, especially looking at the further accelerated adoption of cloud and the related challenges because of course we had a very unique year in 2020. Then I will dive a little bit in the cloud services of CPC. After that, I will pass uh, the presentation over to Graham Fritsch from VM. We'll look at the VM powered BAS and RAS services. And especially we'll pay special attention today on how you need to deal with ransomware. So Citic Telecom CPC. So Citic Telecom CPC offers ICT services on a global scale including China, CIS, and Russia, to enable uh, their customers, so our customers, to run their ICT services in line with local culture, rules, and regulations. And there is a reason, of course, that we have included China, CIS, and Russia, because in these countries, special rules will apply. I will also shortly will touch on that a little bit later part of the presentation, uh, what these rules and regulations are. But let's first dive into the customer challenges of 2021. And of course, we have seen a huge take up of cloud services. And with that, there are challenges related to that. And now the question is what will happen next? Will we go back to normal? And well, during the presentation, I will argue that we will go partly back to normal, but it still will have a significant impact on the ICT infrastructure that you need to run as a company. So let's look at what has happened here. So, Due to COVID, of course, you saw a lot of things happening. So everybody was forced to work from home or people felt more safe to work from home. So that's a significant shift that we have shown happening in the market. The other thing is because people now work from home, they still need to communicate with each other. And well, I've learned a lot of video platforms during this last year. So you also see that happening. So you see something in Teams. You see something in Zoom, you see something in Ring Central, video, WebEx, you name it. It was a huge take up of all kinds of communication mechanisms, including also voice calling, um, to ensure the communication between the uh, different colleagues were running in a smooth way. And related to that, you also saw that there were uh, more cloud things happening, people are putting things more in the cloud. Because nowadays, you know, in the past, you had offices with people sitting there and you would have connections to data centers that will ensure out of the data centers that application would run and that uh, employees can use them. But now by taking away that requirement and seeing that more people work from home, there was also a mental thing about, okay, let's make everything available out of the cloud. Let's lose the physical uh, location in that sense. So. What has happened with the CIOs and CTOs during uh, they enabled the business during the beginning of the global pandemic? So 
for some areas we will partly go back to normal. But what we expect is that the whole infrastructure that has been set up to work from home, to work remotely, to work more flexibly, will stay in place. Because companies, first of all, have invested a lot of money just to keep running. And second thing, would something else happen again, they're already prepared to deal with this. So even though functionally we will see people go more back to offices and everything else, we expect that the whole infrastructure and the multi-cloud approach is something which will, is here to stay. So cloud-enabled remote working will be a default. And it could be the physical spot at the office, but you have the flexibility to work from home and to work from anywhere. Um, of course, there were a lot of quick decisions done um, during uh, the pandemic to uh, facilitate the functionality of the multi-cloud uh, just to make it happen. But you will see an ongoing investment to, without the pressure being there now, to deliver these services in a very structural way, in a controlled way. So what are the benefits of adopting cloud? And let's be clear, the benefits that I'm talking about are the benefits that you should expect from cloud. They are not automatically there. I will come back to that later. The first thing is absolutely true. You know, um, typically what you see happening is the business model moving from CAPEX to OPEX. You're not going to be bothered anymore about buying a server, buying storage and whatever. You know, you go to a cloud and you put everything in there. The other thing what will happen with that, and you also see uh, containers and anything and other ways of working happening there, that it will allow developers to be more agile and to make quicker continuous improvements to applications. If they want to have an additional environment, they can quickly make that happen. It's easy. And of course, the perception is that uh, cloud by definition is high available disaster recovery and redundancy. And yes, in elements of the cloud, it's definitely there. Um, clouds are not deployed with a single CPU, are not deployed with a single storage. There is some redundancy baked in, but that will not do the complete story. We will come back to that later. Oh, hold on, this was one click too many. So bottom line, it should mean that in the end, the goal is that enterprises are not that bothered with running project to extend cloud or extend infrastructure, or extend service and whatever. They have a lot of agility, a lot of flexibility. So can they focus on their core business and the innovation of their business? So what are the challenges in adopting cloud? There are in principle three main categories that you need to look into. The first thing is security and compliance. So what's becoming harder and harder because we now work in a data focused society and data focused world is that you have the potential of data breach. That could be purely for the reason that the data has value, but it could also be for the reason that your data will be ransomed and they want you, the data is very critical for you, for your business. It may not have a value outside your business, but for your business, it means you cannot run anymore. So that's the ransomware part. That's an important element. Related with data breach, because maybe it's not that critical for you that personal data is leaked out, but from a society point of view, that's seen as a major consideration and that leads to uh, privacy gaps, plus the misuse of identity, so false identities. Next to that, you also see governments dealing with the whole explosion of data and want to have some form of understanding on that. So in Russia, you will see, for example, personal data uh, protection law. In China, you, you have cybersecurity laws and there are many laws there. So, and then on top of that, because that's typically just in general what you see happening, you may find, for example, for banking, some specific industries, uh, utilities, you will see additional regulations for industries happening. So if you're moving to cloud, you need to be aware of that. You need to make sure that that's fixed. From a performance perspective, you still want to make sure the cloud is not part of your own touch and feel anymore. So your application performance needs to be right. You need to take care of that. You need to look into that, which application you put on which cloud are you using a software as a service, are you using infrastructure as a service and put your application there. You need to think about your application performance and how that will pan out. And also what the internal use and customer experience will be. 
and how you want to deal with that. And of course, your internal users are your internal customers. The other thing what you need to be aware of is there is no sync cloud solution. If you look at the evaluation that has happened, for example, Teams, that's there in the cloud. You don't have it running on your own uh, own server. Uh, video, uh, Zoom, it's all cloud. Salesforce, all cloud. You know, SAP, a lot of stuff is all cloud. But the cloud will be everywhere. So you need to think about how am I going to manage these multiple applications running on multiple clouds and to ensure that for the end user, the performance is always as it should be. And the last element is business continuity, because you always need to be aware that the application will be there and up and running. So these are things that are challenges, which you need to be aware of that needs to uh, to happen in that sense. Then the uh, other thing which, which is critical in that sense is the uh, uh, management of multiple vendors, because as I said earlier, you will have multiple cloud environments and also Based on that, you want to go for multiple vendors because you don't want to depend on a single cloud party for a lot of reasons. You need to manage then, in that sense, your cost because each vendor you add will cost your money organization. But again, you don't want to put everything in one basket and sometimes you even cannot do that. So you need to look how you're going to cost manage that. And also, even though you're putting a lot of things in the cloud, you still need to have resource and expertise to manage your cloud providers, to manage your application providers. So these are challenges you will find when adopting cloud. Let's dive into one specific item, which is becoming a significant problem in this world. And that's ransomware. Ransomware growth is going through the roof. So if you are looking what the predicted damages was, this is in US dollars, source cybersecurityventures.com. In 2015, that was 325 million as potential damages. The current predictions are 20 billion US dollars. And to make things even worse, or it depends how you look at this, but most of the cyber attacks are not by definition uh, because there is a security issue in the system itself, in the firewall, or whatever. Most cyber securities begin with spare phishing emails. For example, the Continental Pipeline was something that was done by a Pinching email, nothing more, nothing less. So the message of this is that, you know, you can protect what you want, but you need to consider the scenario, what if? Uh, because it's very likely that you, well, you will be under attack anyway, but a successful attack will happen at a certain point in time. It's more than realistic. So you need to think as a company, how am I going to deal with this? in this new trend of pandemics, where you see that you are putting more information spread over multiple clouds, you are putting people at home, which means that the attack surface is becoming bigger and bigger. So the uh, possibilities for people um, uh, or for hackers to enter your network will become bigger. And also because people are isolated, working more from home, they will trust technology more and that will become a bigger and bigger issue so i expect that most companies need to really design well i think all companies need to design a uh, scenario and assume that they will be hacked in one shape or form okay that's a little bit what we see in the trend and what we think uh, should should be the case so let's talk a little bit about uh, the cloud services that uh, we provide as cpc telecom international as you can see, uh, we are on uh, multiple continents and we have a, uh, our own cloud in Moscow, in Russia, and we have multiple clouds in China, also in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, Singapore, but also in Cape Town. And uh, especially for the China part, there are special rules and regulations, which also exist, by the way, for the Moscow cloud. Well, what we see happening with our customers is that we have an advantage that we can be active in uh, areas like China and Russia. I will come back to that a little bit later. But what you also will see is we do not believe that we will be the single cloud provider for a customer. Because as I said earlier, this field of clouds and application is rightly spread 
of uh, software as a service and infrastructure as a service. And what's of course important, as I already said, we are not going to deliver as supplier by ourselves the complete cloud solution. So therefore we have via our private network, because public is always available, we have connectivity created with multiple cloud providers. So outside of China, you will see uh, connectivity direct to AWS, we connect to Austria 65, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and we have it at multiple locations. So we have it in APEC and we have it in Europe. And combined with our own cloud solution, we can bring a total solution for uh, our customers. But also in China, we have that. So we have uh, Tencent, Tencent Cloud, uh, we have Huawei Cloud, AWS, uh, you name it. But the, also the funny thing is, is you see Office 365 and Azure in China and Office 365 outside of China. These are two fully separate worlds. So there you already see that, uh, especially in mainland China, there is specific ruling applicable which forces them to create a separate entity in that sense of Office 365 and Microsoft Azure in China itself. So it means also that you will run into a compliance challenge. I want to talk to you a little bit about that one. So if you look at compliance challenges, there is one other item, and let's see on everybody has a slide, yes. So compliance challenges, it's not only have to do with your equipment needs to be configured in a certain way. In some countries, you will find that a certain vendor, which is available all over the world, is not allowed in that specific country. And that may even, uh, you may think, well, that may be social media and that kind of stuff. No, that may also be really uh, um, normal brands that you will get available all across the world. For example, in Russia, uh, for a very long time, Velo Cloud was not available from one hardware device perspective. In Russia, some uh, Cisco devices are not allowed. So uh, that's all driven by local regulations. So please be aware it's not only how you configure stuff, but also hardware that you may use in the rest of the world are not available there. Um, with that, you also see that governments say that your IT assets need to be proficient in a certain way and maintained in a certain way. If you don't do that, you may get a fine or even be personal uh, eligible. Um, you also need to look, and that's typically what you see more in the European part, is management to avoid data breach, um, especially with GDPR. That's that's an important element. So that's the part of the storage. And then you have general rulings about how are you dealing with the data that you have in your systems? And how are you going to protect that also? Because that's also a very important element in all of the standards. So to summarize, compliance talks about what kind of equipment you can use, how do you manage that, how do you uh, uh, protect your data, plus there are specific rules how you need to deal with the data and how you need to give government or other people access to that. So that's a little bit what, what you will see from a compliance point of view. So I talked about Smart Cloud, so I want to dive a little bit deeper in what we provide for our customers. So we have a private cloud, a hybrid cloud, and a public cloud. So the public cloud we call Smart Cloud Compute. So that's in principle a fully shared platform. Uh, then we have Smart Cloud V1, which is in principle a dedicated hardware platform, but we deliver the technology and services around that um, for the specific customer. Um, so we can control it in a certain way. We do load balancing. Uh, the other thing that we also do is manage VDI. So the remote desktop, and security rules around that. You see that a lot of companies are looking at uh, VDI technologies to ensure that security and also to support the multi-device approach. We do have object storage. And one important thing I really want to dive into a little bit further today also, and VM will also definitely do that, is the backup uh, replication and recovery services. So backup and disaster recovery. So, why is that important and what do you see happening then? So what we believe in is that as you have fundamentally different applications delivered from different clouds, you also need to be aware then that your replication and your backup also needs to run over all these different kind of environments. And there are some logical ones, 
in the sense that you look at the data uh, replication, but you also can think about the VMs itself, so that the applications are backed up and disaster recovery is done. And as this is a path of growth, you need to be able to put this over from physical servers that you still may have running in your own environment to all kinds of virtual servers or public cloud services. But even, and that may be a very interesting one, and I think that VM has a good insight on that, even on software as a service, where you may think, well, I buying something called software as a service, so I am for all fine. Later on, we come back to that and see where there may be some small challenges in that sense. And as you saw on the previous picture, we already have around uh, five locations where you can put the data in that sense. And I talk here about data, but it can also be your applications and your settings of your application. Because you need to not only back up your data, you also need to back up your application environment if you want to get up and running quickly, or you need to have it fully running mirrored on another location. But this talks a little bit about backups in that sense. And there is a fairly common rule, and probably most of you already know that. So the advice is you should have at least three copies of your data. So that means original one and two different copies. You need to uh, store the copies on two different sets of media. So that if something goes wrong in that specific media, or even there could be some software related item that totally uh, screws it up, at least you have other technology behind it. Plus, to prevent the fact that if a site burns down or is truly impacted, you still lose all your data, you need to have one of the applications off site. So, totally three copies, one working, two backup, put on two different formats, and make sure that one is off site. And that's that's a key element to be ensured at least your data is there. You still need to do some additional action, but we'll come back to that later. So let's talk about a, a customer case that we had and where we uh, delivered a solution, which in principle was a company. And by the way, this is uh, is pre-COVID, so there there was, as I said, the cloud adoption was already happening before COVID, but it just accelerated. But this is a case before that. So. Uh, we have a company, international trading company, it's a company which is a customer of CPC. Um, and by the way, if we talk about CPC, I mean City Telecom International CPC, uh, who is providing uh, steel processing services. And they were owning certain processing centers. And in these different processing centers, they had different sets of IT infrastructure. And uh, also in this uh, part, you saw that the traditional IT infrastructure was not able to support the rapid business growth. So they were struggling with that. How can we make that manageable? How can we make that secure and everything else? It took time to deploy, to manage and maintain traditional infrastructure. Because typically what will happen is that the business will just say, as of today, I want to be up and running. Just deliver me the services, the IT services that I need to run my system. And that's not by definition default there, you have it up and running quickly. And especially by the way, nowadays, um, if you look at buying hardware, the lead times of hardware are going up because we have a challenge with the chips uh, that are running in the different hardware devices. So that's an additional challenge that we have right now if you're buying your own infrastructure. And next to that, you also have a limited set of IT expertise. Because typically, uh, you know, the extension of such environments will take up a significant amount of additional expertise or of your resources that you need to allocate them to that specific site. So there were problems also to exit the data and the application from hosted services across different branches because there were different solutions, different connections, everything else. And with that, it also was very much a concern that someone somewhere in the organization at a new location did something which was not in line with compliance and security. Uh, but what even was more concerning, that there would be a potential security risk which will bring down the organization. So what did we do? As you see here, uh, we have offered a combination of a public cloud and a private cloud. You can call it hybrid, whatever you want. And uh, what we did there is 
that we put all the applications uh, that were running on the different locations back towards these two environments. And the uh, main uh, operation environment was running in the V1, so the dedicated cloud for, uh, for the customer. And the customer uses replication and backup, so replication for the VMs itself, the backup for the data to ensure that there was on another location, the uh, backup fully up and running and available. So what did that deliver to the customer? First of all, it hugely simplified the design and the operation. So that means that there was a way more simplified deployment, simplified storage. You also had one storage pool, which gives you a lot of flexibility if you would need to grow. In the old situation, you may run out of storage at a specific location which you then need to fix in another location. Um, you, they were given a 24 by 7 team, which were expert, which we have the scaling capability or advantage, and that we're doing this from console to design and build to support and enhance, so continuous improvement there. Security and comp uh, compliance was fixed there. We had the full data protection. We had both backup and replication and were best, best, better cost allocation estimation because you had one model, one pricing model, it's all OPEX and not this jumps in cost because you need to open a data center at a new location. So to summarize my part of the presentation, COVID-19 has accelerated multi-cloud adoption and remote work, something which was already happening, but it gave an additional push. And yes, we will go back post-COVID, but the infrastructure itself will stay in place. People want to be protected, and they're just going to, instead of making it an emergency approach, they're going to make it a fixed approach now. One very critical thing you need to remember, if things are in a cloud, it doesn't mean that all is taken care of. Local legislation and regulation may be a pain in the butt. So, and also bear in mind, it's not only to deal with the fact where the cloud is located, but also who is accessing the cloud. For example, Google Cloud cannot be reached from a China internet connection or Google Drive, both true by the way. Data needs to be stored locally sometimes by government. And backup replication and recovery is still a important item, even for software as a service. And you need to understand that security is not an inherent part of cloud services because what you could do if you just do a backup of your data and you also copy the uh, ransomware to your environment, it could mean that not only your main data will be encrypted, but also your backup data. So CPC and VM offer joint services to ensure that your cloud solution keeps on working and delivers. It will be a compliant solution, including local legislation and regulation, it will be a high available solution using BRR, including NT ransomware solution, and it will be a very secure solution. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Graham. Hi there. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, right, let me just share my screen. We can see it, Brian. Yep, you got it? Good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there we go. So firstly, uh, I want to thank CPC for, for inviting us to this webinar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present with the, uh, such a good partner. Um, today, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of who Veeam are, in case you don't know us. Uh, and how we're probably already helping you to protect your data, but what we can do more around not just the protection, but the management of that data uh, across these new normal working environments that Serbs talked about. Um, you know, we talked about the multi-cloud environment, the multiple attack surfaces there are, but data is much more spread. Uh, and so you need to be in control of that. I'm also going to look at some of the market trends. Uh, we do a lot of research. We work with other research companies, but do our own research. So I want to share some of what we're seeing there, and that will look forward into what the new normal is going to be. And then finally, you know, we talked about ransomware and also SaaS protection. 
uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the steps that we can take jointly to protect that data, uh, but also to be aware of what are we actually protecting uh, and what isn't protected. So let's look at being by the numbers. Let me just build this out. Um, so we founded the business in 2006, started shipping products in 2008. Uh, and since then, we've grown to be the, uh, according to the latest IDC figures, uh, the second largest vendor of backup and management solutions globally. In EMEA, we, we are by far the largest. Um, so you can see we, we delivered in 20, 2019 over a billion in bookings. Um, we haven't released the figures yet for 2020, but this, they, we've grown on that. So we're one of a select few software vendors that has gone through that one billion uh, barrier. We're very much a global country. We're in over 160 countries, and we have over 400,000 customers now uh, around the world. One interesting thing is that we sell 100% through partners. Our partner ecosystem is hugely important to us, and it gives us a huge advantage in the marketplace because it means you're getting solutions that are delivered by your local partners to your local requirements. And that's especially true in cloud. So we've, we've talked a lot about cloud today already, and everybody refers to cloud as being AWS, Azure, uh, Google, et cetera. But, but for us, it's much more than that. You know, we have 5,000 partners in EMEA, uh, service provider partners in EMEA, that are delivering local cloud solutions and CPC are one of our, you know, our, one of those partners. Um, so it's not just about our products. Uh, one of the things we're immensely proud of is the satisfaction of our customers. Uh, our partners are simple, reliable, and flexible, uh, and we have an NPS score of over 75. And as you can see from the slide here, that's higher than you know some of the big brands that you're used to. Uh, one of the other things is it's three times higher than the industry average score in technology partners. So we're immensely proud that we don't just have great products, but we deliver great service around that as well. I talked to us about it as being the clear market leader, and you know, we, we, we've certainly achieved that. You know, the latest IDC reports, uh, as I say, gave us number one uh, in EMEA, um, a clear market leader, and not only uh, were we the clear market leader in terms of revenue share, but we, we were in terms of growth. And that wasn't just growth year on year where we grew by over 20%, but we also grew quarter on quarter. And as we've moved to this new normal world of norm, everything moving to the cloud uh, and moving to an OPEX model, those quarter on quarter figures uh, are very important to us. So it shows that we're growing on a quarter on quarter basis and we're in increasing our annual recurring revenue. You know, we've moved, as many software vendors have, from a straight perpetual license to subscription and partnering through our cloud providers as well. And that's become an increasing share of our business. Now, I'm not at liberty to give you that, but it's a majority of our business now comes through recurring revenue. So I want to look at a few market trends with you. And this has, again, come from a lot of the, the um, uh, research we've done ourselves. Uh, every year, we, we run our own data protection trends uh, survey. Um, and, you know, we can see that, you know, certainly over the last year, the, the world has faced multiple challenges, uh, certainly from the pandemic. But there was also the rush to digitalization of infrastructure that had started before then and, and was obviously accelerated. And with that, we've, need, we've, we've seen the increase in importance of protecting data. Um, so what has happened in the last year? Well, you can read the figures on the screen. You know, 66% of uh, uh, companies have experienced a strain on their IT organizations. And that was certainly why they got used to working in this, uh, this new uh, way of working that we've all become accustomed to. There was a shortfall in budgets, and not just a shortfall in budgets, but also a shortfall in skills, as you can see from the last bullet point. So people wanted to accelerate their move to the cloud and then move to digital transformation, but were slowed down on doing that by budget and also by skills that they needed. And you know that goes back to what I discussed earlier about our partner system 
And certainly our service provider partners like CPC have been able to help people to make that transformation much quicker. Now this was a, the final point on here, I'm gonna come back to this in, in a few minutes, is the brand of security and governance. 32% of our respondents anticipated a cyber threat to impact their company in the next 12 months. I think that's incredibly low. As Serb said earlier, this is an everyday occurrence now. And if you haven't, if you don't believe you've been attacked, then I really think you should go back and look at your security systems because you will have been attacked and you need to be aware of that and you need to be responding to this on a daily basis. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little later on about how we can help you to do that. I'm not sure if this slide's built properly for you, but just to look at, you know, we looked at how much this acceleration to off-premise to the cloud is happening. And we looked at, you know, how an organization are backing up their data today and where they see that, you know, where they see that being in two years' time. And this is this is quite telling. You know, I think, you know, even now we're looking at just 33% are using an on-premise backup or disaster recovery tool today and that's self-managed. The rest of it is being delivered off-site. So if you look two years out, you see that the prediction is that cloud services or cloud-based services is gonna rise from 49% where it is today, so the 24 and 25 on the left, to over 77%. Now at the same time, the on-premise solutions are gonna more than half in, in their percentage of the market. So it's you know a real telling some you know in, in indication of how quickly we're moving things into the cloud or to off premise. And again, I'm going to stress again that when we talk about cloud, that is not just the hyperscalers that we've talked about. That is all of the local service providers that you're dealing with as well. Okay. And, and how are customers reacting to this? And, and you know, if we look at the issues, oh, I'm sorry, it seems to have jumped when you go back. If we look at what customers are actually doing in terms of that modernization, they want to get away from the legacy systems that they've been using for, for, for many years. They want to, uh, get away from silos of data that are not being reused across multiple platforms within the organization. They want to accelerate the use of hybrid cloud, so keep some of their on-premise where that's relevant, also move to the cloud. And then as Sir, you know, quite eloquently put earlier, data security and compliance is a huge issue. You know, we talked about GDPR earlier, and we're actually seeing now that those fines that were envisaged at the beginning of GDPR are actually starting to be imposed across the industry. So there's been some quite significant fines for, for data breaches imposed by GDPR. But security and that last piece, security is a key thing. And I, I, I really want to touch upon that now. So let's have a look at ransomware. I think everybody on this call is probably very familiar with what ransomware is. And you know what we put onto the slide here is a few of the large ransomware attacks that have been going on and continue to go on since 2018. And it seems that every day when you look at the press, there's a new data breach, there's a new ransomware attack that's, that's you know, being, uh, being committed. You know, I remember we've, we've just gone through Vmon, uh, our largest uh, online show that we do every year. We've just gone through that in the last two days. And last year, it was a very disturbing story by one of our customers um, that came in one morning to find that every single workstation was locked out or with a particular symbol on it, and every printer had printed out a ransomware demand. And, you know, a few days ago in Ireland, the, there was a big attack on the Irish Health Service. Uh, and in that instance, you know, they encrypted all the data and demanded their ransom as normal. But a couple of days later, they came back online and said, here's the tool for you to decrypt your data. And as an act of good faith, we're giving you this tool free of charge so you can get your data back. But if you don't pay the ransom, we will release this data onto the internet. So they were threatening to expose everybody's personal medical histories onto the internet. And you can imagine how damaging that would be. So these are getting more sophisticated uh, and they're more threatening. 
And, you know, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see uh, the rising costs of these account tax. And it's not just the downtime uh, of getting to recover your data. It's the brand reputation that suffers massively. Um, one of the key things is, and you see on the bottom, bottom right of this screen, is 76% of our customers ended up having to spend nothing at all. And we're going to look at how we help you to achieve that goal. So what do we do against ransomware? Well, first of all, we've changed uh, a number of things in our software uh, that allows you to harden the, the beam repositories that we use to make sure that we're reducing the way that those can be attacked. But there's also a number of other features that we've introduced, and I'll mention a couple of those in a minute, that can help. But really, that's only part of the solution. None of this works without proper education of your staff. And for IT being permanently on top of this, you know, I mentioned the figure earlier where only 30% of our uh, customers predicted they were going to get an attack. Everybody is. And as they become more sophisticated, you need to be ahead of the game on this. So without the proper education to make sure that people don't click on those phishing emails that Sir mentioned earlier, we can only do so much. But that's something that you need to be aware of. So what are our capabilities? Well, we make backups of your data, but we don't just make backups. We enable you to manage those backups. And we put a number of additional features in there to make those backups useful to you while they're sat on storage. So once we've made the backup, we can do something called make this immutable. And what that means is that data that's been backed up cannot be altered. It cannot be accessed and it cannot be altered. Now, this gives you a perfectly secure set of data that you can recover from. But what we've seen is people have suffered ransomware attacks. They've gone to their backups. They recovered their backups with the ransomware still in it. So that means that within 15 to 20 minutes of recovering their data, guess what? They're locked out of their data again. So by taking these immutable backups and by using things like Data Labs and Security Store, we can start to analyze those backups to get rid of the malware, to take you back to a clean copy of your data, and then to recover that in a staged way that meets your SLAs for your business, uh, but also guarantees that when we recover it, we're recovering virus-free and ransomware-free workloads and backups, and then allow you to test it. Now, as I say, it's very important that we don't just take backups, but we make that data useful to you as well. So you can test those backups to make sure uh, on a regular basis that you're storing clean data. So it's not just about getting your backups back, it's making sure you're getting them back ransomware free and virus free. And now let's look at SaaS. You know, again, Seb mentioned this earlier, uh, and people say, well, I'm using SaaS, so why do I need a backup? I'm using Microsoft Office 365 or M365. Microsoft takes care of everything. And this is a really, really common perception. Uh, and there's been a couple of high profile cases really where people recently where people have lost their data. So Microsoft takes care of everything. That's not strictly the case. The reality is that Microsoft is there to make sure you can access their infrastructure. They provide availability of the infrastructure, but the data, and this is always going to be the case, the data is your responsibility. It's your responsibility that you're taking adequate backups of that data and that that data is available for you to you under a compliant way. So let's look at six reasons why you need to take those backups of Office 365. You might accidentally delete something and want to recover it. You might have retention policy gaps. You know, how long do you need to retain your data for compliance reasons? And I've seen a number of instances recently where the retention policies of people is going beyond even seven years. You know, one recent uh, customer we dealt with needed to retain data for 10 years. That was part of their local requirements. There's threats. There are internal and external threats. So we talked a lot about ransomware and rogue apps, but there's threats internally as well. 
you know, again, a recent case in the press where a disgruntled employee left an organization and on their way out of the business, deleted all of their data. And it was their Office 365 data that wasn't backed up and they couldn't recover it. So again, you need to protect yourself from that. I've talked about the legal and compliance, the retention policies, but also making sure only the right people have access to data. When you recover data, you can do that in a way that is also GDPR compliant. So you can adhere to things like the right to be forgotten. But then you also need to be able to manage it. And, and once you move from one SaaS platform to another, can you migrate that data to the new platform? And one final reason, Office 365 is not just email, it's Teams. You know, the, the explosion of, of the collaboration apps that we've been using during lockdown, and Teams is at the forefront of that. Are you backing up your Teams data? If somebody came to you with a litigation hold and showed me all the conversations about a certain subject, could you show the Teams data that back that up as well? So there's a number of reasons why you need to back this up. How often do these issues happen? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but as you can see, 37% uh, it, how, you know, the data loss that has been experienced in the cloud, and how often does this happen? Malware retention policies. So this is happening on a daily basis, and I'm sure you've got, a, you've got experience of this as well. So what exactly is Microsoft giving you? So this is what we call the shared responsibility model. And I won't go through all of this, I'm just gonna pick out a couple of parts of it. So if you delete something, after one month, that is permanently deleted. If somebody leaves the business, after one month, their account is permanently deleted. And you can see the same for SharePoint and OneDrive. There's an initial stage, there's a second stage, but after that, it's permanently deleted and you can't get it back. And auto-archiving happens after one month. So if you need to recover that data, can you recover it in the way that you want to recover it? Can you get it back? I want one particular email message, one particular Teams message, or do you have to recover the whole thing? So this is exactly what Microsoft does. So what does Veeam offer? Well, you're not gonna be surprised by the next diagram, but we offer protection across the whole of that piece. So we can make sure that if somebody leaves the company, for instance, their account is deleted and you, you can get that data back. You know, they might have important information on one of your biggest customers within their email. And if they've left the business, that account would have been deleted. There's no way to recover that data. We give you the, the tools to do that by user, by account, by email message, by document within SharePoint. So protection across every single one of those elements, meaning that your data is not only recoverable, but portable across different SaaS platforms as well. And that's a key, key metric you need to look at. So how many different types of recovery options do we provide? Well, you can see them on the screen here. As I say, it's not just about recovering the whole user account, it's about having the power to recover on a very granular level. And with that, hopefully we've been giving you a good overview of the way the market is moving. Uh, and if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. Thank you very much indeed. June, uh, do you want me to pick up on some questions we received? I will do that, I think. So uh, we had one of the questions that we received there was, uh, can CPC provide backup solutions for customers existing cloud environment, Ali Cloud and or physical service? Well, absolutely. And um, I want to also, uh, there was a previous slide in the screen that I want to use with. And let me see until it's building up. Yeah. So. In this environment, and yes, it's our service in the middle, but in principally, we have an environment which is uh, based in Smart Cloud, where we do all the replication and backup. 
and we have connectivity and possibility of backup and replication towards a physical server. We have the possibility to do a virtual server, but we also have the capability of doing to a cloud service, a public cloud environment. And that includes Ali Cloud, also includes AWS, and it also includes uh, Microsoft Azure environment. And on top of that one, we also have a backup capability uh, as being discussed by VM out of OS 365. So to come back to your question, um, for Ali Cloud, uh, we definitely can do that. And we also could do it for physical service and also for VMware Hyper-V infrastructure. So, so I hope that that answers the question. Then there was another question that popped up. Can CPC configure backup with any intervention from the customer side? Well, to be totally honest, that was the default way how we did it. Um, and now we have created a portal uh, already for some time, which allows the customer to do that. So to control when the backup is happening. So in principle, there are two options. We fully manage that for the customer. We also, on the upfront decision or timing, uh, decides that we're going to back up and how we're going to back up it. But uh, we also have the option that the customer itself, via portal, uh, can um, arrange the backup at specific times. Um, that's all the questions I have received. Did you receive any questions, Graham? Uh, the one I saw was around, I don't know, I'm going to just read that. Yeah, cross-cloud recovery. Can we recover from one different platform to another? Um, yes. So one of the things that we major on is this uh, cross-cloud mobility or cloud mobility. Uh, and one of the particular areas of strength that we have is the ability to take uh, an on-premise workload, well, whatever that's running on, and to instantly recover it onto a VMware-based platform. So similar to the CPC platforms that Serge talked about earlier. So if you're running on Hyper-V locally or you're running in another cloud platform and you want to perform a DR uh, or instant VM recovery, we can move that straight onto a VMware platform, meaning that people are back up and running very much quicker than they probably would have been uh, previously. Um, it's it's a key tenant of uh, our business that we want to make sure that data is available. Once it's been backed up, we can recover it to any different cloud platform. Okay, thank you, Graham. I have received uh, another question, which is related to uh, um, uh, the multi-tier backup strategy. Uh, I think that is possible, but not in all circumstances. So I would like to come back to that question via email. So we'll share you that information. So I think that's that's important, but we need to figure that out. And the other question is, is CPC using VM for BRR? CPC Smart Cloud? Yes, absolutely. And that's also the reason we have the joint uh, Sean Jessen today. Uh, I can even tell you that CPC also uses the uh, VM solution internally. So our whole data environment is back up to via using the VM software. So we're eating our own dog food in that sense. Uh, which applications and tools CPC use for providing backup uh, DRM application services? I think that's a similar one. So in principle, we're using uh, VM mainly for, for that one. And we have some small other ones, but we will respond to that at a later stage. And there is another question falling in. Is your slide on third-party cloud indicated? Yeah, it's, it's present in China. And the question is there, um, what are the functional differences between the version of Office 365 in China and outside of China? Well, first of all, um, you want to jump into that or? No, no, I'm, I'm glad you're going to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the, what you need to remember, of course, that um, the Office 365 capability exists in China, but it's offered by a company called 21 Vianet. And 21 Vianet is a combination of Microsoft has shares in that, but the majority hold by a Chinese investor. 
And you need to remember that due to local regulations, you will find that some applications are not supported, like Teams and Jammer. So by the way, the look and feel is almost it's the same, but it doesn't have some uh, capabilities. Next to that, you also need to be aware that you know you can make web pages very easy out of Office 365 SharePoint. If you do that in China, you need to be aware that you have a so-called ICP license that you require. If you don't have that, you're on breach and you can have significant fines on that one. And so you need to remember that if you go there, it looks the same, but you're missing functionality. Second thing, certain actions that you can do requires additional licenses from the government. But you absolutely need to remember that in principle, these are two different worlds. So you will find that the China 365 domain uh, in it, uh, that combining these domains together doesn't work. There are two different worlds. So hopefully that uh, is satisfactory for uh, the question. So I see right now there are no other questions right now. So I would like to thank um, Graham for joining us and supporting us in this presentation. I would like all the people that joined during this webinar. I hope you find it useful and we always uh, uh, are more than willing to help you. If you have these kind of questions, please contact your CPC account rep for that. And we will come back and give via email answers on all questions that have been asked. Thank you very much for your time and I wish you a very good day. Cheers. Thank you bye very bye. much indeed. Cheers. Bye-bye.